Again, we're very fortunate to have come in contact with such a personality, Shula Prophet, and he has given us, in his physical absence, his guidance to his world. And those who are succeeding him, but taking up the mantle of um, accepting disciples, they have to stick to the words that Shula Prophet gave us. And so it's a very nice system. We have Shula Prophet's books by which we can check to see if his followers are actually giving us what he gave us, saying what he said, living their lives according to his direction. But sometimes, somehow or other, uh, there's confusion. Although, like I said yesterday, I, one of the things that I love about Srila Prabhupada is the clarity with which he presents the philosophy. I was attracted, first of all, by the philosophy of Christian consciousness. And the clarity is unparalleled. There's no I think maybe perhaps, or there's no obfuscation, and everything is very clear. So it becomes a little bit bewildering to me when, when persons who are claiming to be followers of Prophet present something other than what Prophet presented. Because <laughs> Prophet gave us the clarity. So, for instance, Prophet gave us the four regular principles of freedom to follow. Because, yes, chanting is the goal, the means, everything. Chanting is everything. There's a nice, uh, uh, and you'll find the more songs of the Vaishnava Acharya, there's a very nice poem there. It's not ascribed to any of the Vaishnava Acharyas, it's just it's anonymous, but you know, it begins Madaram, Maravyopi, Mangale, Yopi, Mangalam, Pavanam, Pavanam, Yopi, Harinam, Yopi. This Harinam, the holy name of Lord Hari Krishna, is all that there is. That's what this whole poem is convincing of us. So it says, Madaram, Maravyopi, Yopi. Madaram, Madaram means what? Who knows? Sweet. sweet. So of sweet things, Madaram, Madaram, Yopi. It is the sweetest. Mangala, Yopi, Mangala. Mangala. And we come to Mangala Artika every morning. What does that mean? Auspicious. Auspicious. So auspicious things, it is the most auspicious. Madaram, Madaram, Yopi. Mangala, Yopi. The Mangala. Pavanam, Pavanam, Yopi. What does Pavanam mean? The pure. Pure. Yeah. So of all purifying things, it's the purest. Harinam, Yopi. So like that. Bunch of stanzas you can look at it and try to learn it. So the point is, yes, the holy name is everything, but Prophet said it has to be chanted with a certain quality. And that quality of chanting is attained by avoiding the ten offenses. Right? And in order to even want to, to desire to avoid those ten offenses, one has to be living a pure life. And pure life means following these four principles. Uh, on one morning walk, Prophet said, Anyone who can't follow this, these four principles is not even human. So it's not that Prabhupada is being heavy, this is pure Shastra. Ahara Nivya Bhaya Bhakti Namcha Saman Eita Pashabi Saman. Dhamma Hite Shamani Kovashesha Dhamma Eta Hina Pashabi Saman. So it's eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. These things are common to humans and animals. So what is this thing, distinguishing factor? What is it that makes a human being a human being and not an animal? By accepting dharma, and in the case of the line that we're following, it means sanatan dharma, dharma, varnashram, all of that. That's a package. So part of the varnashram system, part of the sanatan dharma, is to live a pure life, to avoid these simple activities. To avoid simple activities. So no meat eating, no fish, no eggs, that's one category. No gambling, no intoxication, and the one where people come a little bit confused, no innocent sex. But Prophet spoke very clearly on this. I have heard that you don't have the letter of instruction yet translated into Sylvania. But most of you read English, so you should read this book very thoroughly. In the very first verse, Bacho Vega Pasa Kohe Vega Jiva Vega Mura Pasa Vega. Eitan Vega. No, Eitan Vira. Saramama Pima. Pretty Vim Sashishya. We're talking about Guru here, so this verse is very applicable. Who can become a Guru? At least in the preliminary stage, one has to qualify himself or herself in this way. One has to control vajo vegam, urge to speak, manasako, and then the, the, the demands of the mind, krodha vegam, pushing up anger. Uh, anger comes from when lust is frustrated, so when one is still lusty, it's easy to become angry. So vajo vegam, manasako, jiva vegam, the demands of the tongue. Uder the demands of the belly and genital. One who can control a sober person who can control these urges, 
is then becomes qualified to accept disciples. May not yet be on the Utah platform, but at least has to be on this platform, controlling these six virgins. So in that, it's a very long purport to that very first verse. So I chose just two paragraphs that Alfred wrote on this subject of what it means to listen to that. So Prophet says, listen clearly. If you have not read that book, you should read it. And if you have, and read it again. It's very clear. Prophet says in one, two par paragraphs on that one subject. So I'm going to read both of them. Prophet says, in a similar manner, the urges of the genitals, the sex impulse, can be controlled when not used unnecessarily. Very clear. When not used unnecessarily. The genitals should be used to beget a Christian conscious child, otherwise they should not be used. Is there any doubt or <laughs> lack of clarity there? Should be used to beget a Christian conscious child, otherwise they should not be used. The Christian consciousness movement encourages, listen, encourages marriage, not for the satisfaction of the genitals, but for the beginning of Christian conscious children. So probably saying, yes, get married. No problem there. As soon as the children are a little grown up, they are sent to our Guru Guru school, where they are trained to become fully Christian conscious devotees. Many such Christian conscious children are required, and one who is capable of bringing forth Christian conscious offspring is allowed to utilize his genitals. Is there anything in this paragraph that's not clear? If there is, please let me know at the end. I can try to answer and make it more clear. Then, then there's another paragraph. Further on, the prophet deals with the same subject again. The prophet says, as far as the urges of the genitals are concerned, there are two, proper and improper, or legal and illicit sex. So again, there's a distinction. It's not that any sex is okay. There's proper sex and there's improper sex. There's legal sex and illicit sex. Very clear. Probably it's always so clear. It's so attractive to his teachings. When a man is properly mature, he can marry according to the rules and regulations of the Shastras and use his genitals for, for getting nice children. Again, I make my point. That is legal and religious. Otherwise, he may adopt many artificial means to satisfy the demands of the genitals and he may not use any restraint. In other words, one has to allow oneself to be restrained by the Shastra. When one indulges in illicit sex life as defined by the Shastras, either by thinking, planning, talking about, or actually having sexual intercourse, or by satisfying the genitals by artificial means, he is caught in the clutches of Maya. Again, very, very clear. These instructions apply not only to household, householders, but also to Tyandis, or those who are in the renounced order of life. <coughs> So, Prophet has made it extremely clear. I don't see where there's any more confusion on this point. So, this is our real wealth in the International Society of Christian Conscious, uh, Consciousness, is that we have Srila Prophet's very, very clear instructions on how to execute spiritual life. And if we do that, the end result is that we will very quickly realize how fortunate we are to have this heritage much of it. That's all we need. We don't need anything else. Just remain attached to hearing about the mantra, chanting the mantra, inducing others to chant. That's all we need. This is our life. International Society for Krishna Consciousness, otherwise known as the Hare Krishna Movement. When I speak in school, they always ask them, why are we called the Hare Krishna Movement? And most of the time, they're scratching their head. Even though the mantra is on the board, they always put the mantra first. <laughs> So I said, the answer's on the board, just look. <laughs> oh yeah, because you guys are always saying Hare Krishna. Yes. So people know us as the Hare Krishna people, the Hare Krishna movement. But again, there has to be a quality to that chanting. And that quality comes from living a pure life by following the order of the principles and trying to satisfy the order of the spiritual master. Prophet said, um, 
My, I'm just executing the order of my spiritual master. I took it as my life and soul. One conversation. And if you can do similarly, take my desire as your life and soul, then that will be your perfection. So Prophet's desire is very, very simple. Not complicated. He wants us, first of all, to make our lives perfect by following his process, and then, as far as possible, try to help others to come to the same standard. Okay, so we can stop here. We leave some time for discussion. If anybody has any questions, comments, Yes, sir. Well, sometimes Prabhu says in his books that one should not have sex life outside of marriage. So it seems that probably sometimes says one thing and sometimes says another thing. Yes, I'm only having sex life, but only within marriage, so therefore probably it's authorized. But then you have to go further and find out what, what that definition of sex within marriage is. It's not just make it up yourself. And then here, this is where you find it. The answer is very clearly given of what sex within marriage means. When we began in Christian Constitution and not using unnecessary, not for sense gratification, I said that over and over and over again, very consistently. So you can take that one statement, but then you have to look at the meaning of the words in that statement. And if you say, yes, Prabhupada said sex within marriage only, but then what is the quality of that sex? You clearly don't find it elsewhere, so you have to find it. That's why it becomes important. I'm glad marriage brought this up. It's so important to look at the entire body of Shiva Prabhupada's presentation. Not just to take one book or one paragraph or one sentence. One has to read the whole thing. And on top of that, if you can go further and also listen to all his lectures and conversations, then it becomes really, really clear what the problem he has. Well, also, Providence is talking to different audiences. The common person, if he can restrain himself to only having sex within marriage, that's quite an austerity for him. On the other hand, if you want to become a devotee, as Rupa Goswami is explaining, what to speak of a pure devotee, then there may be a different standard that you have to follow. Yeah. So if you try to find some places where Prabhupada is referring to another audience and then transfer it to the audience that you're part of and say, well, that's the standard they follow, so we can also follow the same standard that's better known as cheating. Yes. Yeah. Prophet established a society, he had no seven purposes. Prophet was down to the, you know, crossing every T, dotting every I. If you look, when he started his legal devotees in, in, in Johnson, he wrote down what the typical day of the devotee should be like. Everything, even down to eating more large and sweets and taking a nap at a certain time. Prophet wrote everything. So he's, he's giving us extremely clear, consistent, instructions on how to become a devotee. Now the, the point is, do we want to become devotees? If we are, if we do, then it's very clear. If we don't, then everything becomes money. The prophet said, Christian consciousness is simple. If you're simple, difficult if you're broken. Very complicated if you're broken. If you're a very straightforward person, it's very easy to follow Shri Prophet. But if you're looking for loopholes and ways to do your own thing, then of course, you're going to find it. And, uh, but what the, what the result is going to be ultimately, that remains to be seen. Prabhu used to cite a big Gallic proverb, Bhajan Kora, Sadan Kora, Marti Jangalhari. In other words, there's a standard way of doing things. Now you may do it your own way if you want to, but the result will be tested at the time of death. You see? I can fool you about how I'm doing my Christian consciousness, you can fool me about how you're practicing, and we all look very nice to each other, but ultimately, at the time of death, your sadhana and your bhajan will be tested. Who are you going to remember? I probably told a story here when in 1996 I gave a class in Zurich about being prepared to die, being ready to leave the body. So after the class, when Ramachari came up to me, I said, you know, we're being trained to remember Krishna at the time of death, to chant Hare Krishna. So this Brahmachari came to me and he said, I, you know, Prabhu, I have to tell you a story. Recently I was in a very bad car accident and at the point of impact, I did not say Hare Krishna. I said something I can't repeat. It's, <laughs> oh, fill in the blank, something. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be tested. You may do things your way. You may think you see some loopholes and you don't want anyone to tell you how to live your life. It's my life after all. I've built my way. Okay, fine. Do it your way. But at the time of death, 
What are you going to remember? Are you going to remember Prabhupada's instructions? Are you going to remember Krishna? Or are you going to remember some deviation that you got to get attached to? So if we really want to achieve the success, which is Krishna Prema, Prema Pumarta Mahat, this is the goal of everything we're doing, to get back to normal new platform. For, for, for us, it looks like Mount Everest, but it's actually normal. <laughs> That's the normal state of being for living entities in the spiritual world. They're all completely in love with the Lord. So to get back to that point, if we really want to get there, we have to follow strictly the path that's been chalked out by Srila Prabhupada. And if we do something other than that, then we may not get the goal. We have nobody to blame but ourselves if we don't. Yes. Prabhupada once said that Every woman should get married, and every man should be brought to life. So, in case you didn't hear that, you're saying that Prophet once said the women, women should all get married, and the men should remain celibate. <coughs> Brahmins are. But it's understood. I mean, even the, at the height of Vedic culture, that didn't happen. Some men always got married. To compensate, of course, during the height of Vedic culture, there was polygamy. So some men were allowed to have more than one wife. But that's strictly forbidden in our society. In the beginning, Prophet kind of discussed it and he wanted to hear ideas from different boys. But then ultimately he said no. He said, first of all, it's not permitted in modern Western society. And you can't even maintain one wife. Where's there any question of getting married to more than one? You don't even know how to properly maintain one wife, so there's no question of having more than one. So that has been dealt with already. Periodically people bring it up again. Well, but probably already dealt with that. No. No, no totally. So yes, you can have one wife. And but again, following the instructions of Srila Prabhupada. Getting married for beginning Krishna conscious children, which is a very heavy responsibility. So I want you to think very carefully before taking it on. Because if we take it on and we don't do it properly, it becomes a disservice and a disturbance to become a father, mother, and not properly raise the children. It creates a disturbance. So we don't want to be a disturbance in our society when society at large. We want to create or bring in to be vessels for this little, we're not creating, we can't create. The souls are already there. And based on the consciousness of the parents, they will attract a certain soul to the womb. So, um, yeah. I mean, you talk to senior householders and they can tell them. Uh, maybe if they're honest, out of my three children, two of them were, were 50 round babies and the third one wasn't. Whatever. <laughs> but even though it, one may be very pure of oneself, like Srila Prabhupada was, obviously pure devotee in his married life, but it's not necessarily a guarantee that the offspring will be. All you can do is try your best. See, we have to try our best. To be, have the right consciousness at the time of procreation and to raise the children as Christian consciously as possible. And um, leave the rest up to Krishna. Because again, even pure devotees don't necessarily produce offspring of the same caliber. One time one devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, you know, Srila Prabhupada, I've heard that Bhakti Nod Thakur prayed for a ray of Vishnu and then he was given Bhakti Siddhanta. So should we pray like that? Prabhupada said, no, you're not Bhakti Nod Thakur. <laughs> you cannot pray for a ray of Vishnu. <laughs> you're not Bhakti Nod Thakur, you're not a pure devotee yourself, there's no question. But as far as possible, try to enter into family life, into Grihasta life. It was the right conscious. Somehow, in the early days especially, People thought that this person is having a hard time being a brahmachari. Let's get him married. No! No! If you want good grihasas, you have to start with good brahmacharis and brahmacharinis. If you take bad brahmachari, can't maintain brahmachari ashram, how is he going to be a good grihasta? It's not going to happen. Grihasta is not a dumping place for bad brahmacharis who can't. You know? And then you wonder later on why they can't stay married. No, if you dump all the bad brahmacharis into Grihasa life, then you're going to have bad Grihasa Asha. You're going to have Griya Medes, not Grihasa. So the natural course is that one becomes trained nicely as a brahmachari, follows strictly, and then at some point, the choice can be made. Do I want to remain in that Asha, or do I want to go on to the next Asha, the Grihasa Asha? 
Well, it's just natural. One time when Sonyasi in our movie, still in our movie, I won't say who oh, because I don't want to you know, embarrass him. Not that it's embarrassing, he told the story himself, but you can find out who it was. Anyway, he said he was walking with Prophet and he asked Prophet, why do pure devotees get married? Because he was confused. If somebody's a pure devotee, why aren't they you know, nicely to love each other? So he asked Prophet, why do pure devotees get married? And Prophet walked a few steps before he answered it. He said, because it's natural. So they kept walking, and he was still confused. So he asked again, but you're the Prophet, why do pure devotees get married? Prophet took a few more steps and said, because it's natural. And then he asked for a third time, but you want And Prophet, you're asking because you want to get married. <laughs> so it's actually natural. It's a natural progression to go from Ramacharya life to Grihasa life to Manaprasa life to, to Nyas. That's the natural progression of the Vedic culture. It's not unnatural. So get Sri Pancha touch, Lord Chaitanya married twice. Agreta was married then. Shiva is married, man. Like that. So there's nothing against marriage. If you look at our Acharya line, probably the majority of them were married. Bhakti Bhattapur, Kishore Das Bhamji Maharaj. So marriage is not an impediment to becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. We have to execute each ashram properly to the best of our ability. First, Brahmachari, Zayamidhasta, and Vanakrasa. And if you do that, then the idea is that ultimately you're becoming pure and pure and pure. It's not some people think that you, if you're a nice brahmacharya, you get married and you're fine. Yes, the possibility is there that your consciousness could go down, but not if it's done properly. If you follow these instructions that Prabhupada gave very clearly on how to execute Grihasta Ashram, then your consciousness will continue to improve. It's not that I'm going to be a nice brahmacharya, you get married and yeah, yeah. No. And another bad tendency is that the men tend to want to always blame the wife. Well, she's not following me properly, and then, no. If you're not a pure soul, why can, how can you demand that your wife be pure? It's not possible. Not possible. So to the best of both partners' abilities, they should try to follow Srila Prabhupada strictly and make nice, gradual process of progress towards the ultimate goal. Okay? Can you have a question? Yeah. One more before we close. Thank you for It's not my definition, it's true from it. Yes. Uh, yeah. I know, but uh, because uh, he often times, he, 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 he did directly connect uh, one's advancement with uh, absence of, uh, uh, of this acting for us or, 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 or feeling us or whatever. I mean, often. So uh, I also try to take this to my heart. But uh, <laughs> even if for a long time I don't have big difficulties with lust, sometimes I, 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 in the evening, for example, I am with the book, uh, with Shasta, and then in the middle of the night I open my eyes full, full of lust, uh, seemingly coming out of nowhere. And uh, it's hard to do nothing or not to act upon uh, this strong impulse. So what would you advise? It's really, really, really very simple. We, every one of us here has a material body. And we know what that material body is made of. Skin, bone, blood, stool, urine. It's not a very nice thing, the material body. And that's why when somebody dies, we don't maintain the body. We bury it, we burn it, we leave it for animals to eat, depending on the culture. The body is actually not a very attractive thing. So when we find ourselves being attracted to bodies, we should know we're not healthy. It's not a healthy attraction. We have each of us a body. We know. We know what it's made of. It's not a nice, it's a bad bargain. So if we find ourselves being attracted to material bodies, there's something wrong. And we should want to get out of that consciousness. See? That's it's as simple as that. What am I attracted to? What am I attracted to? It's a body. And a body's not a very attractive thing. So, once we realize that, we let that realization really sink in, then when we start feeling that attraction, we say, no, I need to get out of this. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Shiva Prabhupada Ki